So we have a big treasure to host magic gilgus. Uh, he finished his PhD at the World University of Technology, actually, working with uh, lasers and heat technology. Well, thank you for this appreciation <laughs> and kind of promotion for me. Very nice. Okay, so this will be a little different talk when I gave to this uh, Neo Planet uh, School. That one was uh, the other one was really kind of simple and introductory. This will be kind of halfway between uh, art, astronomy, and something more general. So if I get too technical and I kind of I, I dive into some technical stuff, you know, you can yell at me or uh, stop me. I was trying not to make it too uh, technical. So I'll be talking about the first image of a, a black hole in the galactic center that Stephen Horizon Telescope collaboration published in May uh, this year. But for the context, let's take a look at our galactic center. This is an image on quite a large scale. This is a kind of macroscopic view of the galaxy. The angular uh, range is a couple of square degrees, meaning that this is something you would see with your eye if your eye were able to look at two gigahertz uh, radio wave. They're not. So you, you won't see that, but this is the center of our galaxy on kind of large scale. So uh, full moon is 30 uh, arc minutes. This is a couple of square degrees. Uh, and we're interested in this part. Uh, this is like a dynamical center of our galaxy. So if we measure how things are rotating, they are rotating around this region. This is the brightest region uh, in uh, radio frequencies. And somewhere, somewhere deep inside this image, on the sub pixel level of this background image, where is this guy? So, this is a black, blurry donut uh, which corresponds to a supermassive compact source in the center of our galaxy that we released with the Event Horizon Telescope uh, a couple of uh, months ago. So, I like to say that this background image is so beautiful. I love it, but it's my second favorite image of the galactic center. I like this one more because it took us like five years of, of work to get that. But still, do appreciate how interesting this is. All this structure in the background, uh, it's very complicated environment. This is actually the background represents spectral index. So, so sort of a small of the uh, spectral energy distribution. So these colors are really telling you that this is different uh, property of matter at different locations or where it's a different magnetic field or different density, different temperature. So it's really a hot mess uh, in, uh, in the galactic center. So now let's take a look at some scale in between, between this uh, red uh, square and between this scale. So now we are talking about arc minute scales. You can see there's still a lot of structures in the galactic center. So I will draw your attention to a couple of structures in the galactic center. Uh, this feature, we call it a mini spiral. This is visible at radio frequencies. It's a gas slowly trickling uh, into the uh, galactic center. I will mention it a couple more times during my talk. Uh, here is an interesting feature uh, called the clockwise stellar system. This is where heavy wolf-right type of stars live. Those are the stars that emit a lot of uh, uh, stellar wind. And it is likely that actually majority of material that this guy, uh, the Sagittarius star, is consuming comes from these guys, from the heavy stars and the winds that they are uh, they are emitting. But this is sort of it's not hundred percent. We are we have different hypotheses about it. Uh, when there are uh, uh, the stars uh, that people probe in infrared. So you may recall uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020, that was for tracking the motion of stars at infrared frequencies. And those guys are inside this uh, sphere of the Bondi radius. And the most famous of those stars, the S2 star, that is getting clo the closest to the uh, galactic center on an orbit of 16 years is here. So this is the 16 years orbit. And deep, deep, still inside, only there you have these guys. So this orbit is still like thousands of Schwarzschild radii, and here you are looking at really Schwarzschild radius uh, scale, even horizon scale uh, of, a, of a black hole. And this Bondi radius is what? Bondi radius is a, a radius that corresponds to the location where gravity of a black hole or compact object overcomes uh, other end. Uh -huh. So this is the sphere of influence of the black hole where the black hole dictates the motion of objects. So this is why those stars 
they mostly dominated by this massive element, and this is how they were able to measure the mass and distance to this uh, mass object, and this is what they got the Nobel Prize for. And what is the size of this? What is the size of the only radius? Yeah. It actually depends because it depends on the uh, uh, on the proper not, not just black hole but also properties of matter. It is de defined as when the Keplerian velocity uh, is larger than the speed mm -hmm. of sound. But it, uh, yeah, in, in terms of hand, hand wave speaking, it can be 10 to 4, 10 to 5 short mm -hmm. uh, So so these stars are a little closer, but they are not uh, approaching to a distance uh, like 10 short uh, farther away. So there is a long story how we uh, got to observing uh, such as a star. And uh, I, I will not go through all those you know, historical remarks. It would actually be quite a, an interesting talk to give, a, like, talk about the history of these 50 years of us approaching uh, such a a star, but that's not the talk I am giving today. So uh, let me just say that I consider that from the first detection of this compact source in the galactic center uh, in 1974, to 2022, this is like 50 years of, of, of progress. And I think I can say that this is sort of a culmination of these uh, 50 years of work uh, when we are actually able to resolve this uh, compact feature. So I will make a remark about uh, stuff that happened actually before 1974, before the first detection. So uh, in 1960s, astronomers accepted or started accepting the idea that quasars are powered by supermassive black holes. So that was the beginning of 1960s. And then uh, Lyndon Bell pro proposed, um, okay, maybe it's not qu just quasars, not just not the bright distant galaxies, maybe all the galaxies were quasars once. They burned out, they don't have any fuel to use, but then they have supermassive black holes in their centers. That I will do not emit uh, too much light. And in particular, why shouldn't there, there be such an object in our galactic center? And then people started a hunt for this object. That was like about 1965, let's say. And for a couple of years, they were trying to locate a compact radio source, a really, really compact feature in the galactic center. But you saw the image of the galactic center. There was a whole bunch of mess. And actually, Sagittarius A star is not really an impressive black hole, to be honest. Sorry to you know not be a local patriot of our galaxy, but it, uh, the volumetric luminosity of Sagittarius A star is about that of hundred suns. So hundred suns for a supermassive black hole. Come on, if we compare it to quasars with billions of, uh, of suns of power, that's nothing. So this guy is really really, really weak. So there is a lot of stuff you know when you don't have enough resolution, you can miss it easily. And that was the problem, why it took a couple of years of this hunt for a compact object in the galactic center to actually localize it and say, okay, there is an unresolved point source uh, emitting a lot of uh, uh, radio emission. Maybe this is uh, our quasar remnant. But you know, it's good for us that it's not so bright. Yeah, of course, I mean, living next to a quasar should be should be a fail, I guess. <laughs> Could be a very nice yes, I, I don't think living next to like uh, huge quasar is very good for civilization. Fully agree. Uh, right. So this is a, a bit from a paper uh, that claims the discovery for the first time. They managed to improve the resolution sufficiently to say that it's really a compact uh, radio feature. And there is an interesting story uh, how the name was coined. Uh, because back then in 1974, the object wasn't named in any particular way. The name was proposed in 1982, a paper. It is a very well known paper for the reason that, uh, it's, well, it gave a name to the object. But also, it's an interesting thing to know, notice about this paper that it was a paper that is wrong uh, because this paper uh, interpreted the mini spiral feature that we already saw, this bunch of uh, green lines on the, uh, one of the previous slides. This is the mini spiral as seen at low radio frequency. And they thought that well, it does look like a jet feature, like a processing jet, something that we see in the distant quasar. It's wrong, it's not. That, it's not an outflow, it's a slow um, uh, inflow emitting just uh, thermal radiation. Uh, but nevertheless, 
uh, this idea that they proposed in 1982 supported the notion that, well, okay, so there should be a supermassive remnant of a quasar or some supermassive object in the in the core. So it's still a famous paper, and it's a nice attempt to um, uh, to uh, describe uh, reality. It only turned out not to be uh, correct. So how do we get to this extremely, extremely compact and small feature? When I'm talking small, I'm talking about 50 microarc second scale. 50 microarc second scale is about one in 40 million of diameter of a full moon. So full moon is kind of big, but divided by 40 million, and this is where you get the resolution required to image um, uh, the source. So how do we get to a high resolution? Because of diffraction the limit, there are only two ways using shorter wavelengths or using larger telescopes. So, to use the larger telescope, as long as we are bounded to be on the surface of the Earth, well, the largest telescope we can get is the Earth itself. You won't get uh, any large. So, there is a technique that allows you to pretend that the dish of a radio telescope, a radio antenna, is entire Earth. But it only has active surface parts at a couple of locations. So it's like a very empty uh, antenna dish. And this technique that allows you to treat individual telescopes as a little bit of a surface of a huge telescope is called interferometry. And in particular, it's a very long baseline interferometry technique when we are talking about uh, telescopes that are not physically connected. Another technique that gives us this extreme resolution uh, that uh, allows to well, look deep into the uh, sources. But this array is a little more complicated than that because uh, two of the sides of the Indian Horizon Telescope, of this global array of radio dishes, uh, are interferometric array themselves. So this is ALMA, the most powerful uh, radio telescope we have on this planet, uh, and SMA on the top of Mauna Kea. So uh, they are themselves interferometric array. So normally, they they also pretend to be a big dish, but that of the size of a kilometer, about not size of the Earth, not 10,000 kilometers, and they pretend to uh, to be a, a, this sort of one single uh, big dish. But in order to make them work for the Event Horizon Telescope, we had to make them forget that they are connected elements interferometers and ask them to, hey, could you just look at the source, sum sum up coherently all all the signals, and don't try to calculate correlations between individual dishes. Well, really we did both things because astronomers are very greedy by nature. If they can have different types of data, they want to have different types of data. So we wanted to have a data uh, for this global array, but also for the, for the local array. And now the reason why we wanted that uh, is we hope that studying this larger scale picture by a smaller one kilometer dish, not 10,000 kilometer dish, would allow us to better calibrate the data for this huge map. So, and why do we want to do that? There is one particular reason worth mentioning, and that is the problem of a source variability. So, if you compare the properties of M87, which is the first black hole that we imaged back in 2019, uh, and you compare it with Sagittarius A star, the black hole in our galactic center. Sagittarius is uh, of lower mass by factor of 1500. So it means all the time scales involved are shorter by a factor of 1500. So it means that if some characteristic scale, uh, GM over the C square, this is like a, a time in which light passes half of the Schwarzschild radius. Um, is nine hours for this object, then it means it's about 20 seconds for this object. Now, if in our interferometric technique, we synthesize a single image during the entire night of observation, because we rely on the Earth rotation as uh, Earth rotates, it provides us with slightly different uh, aspect of the data, slightly different aspect of observation. So to get a lot of data, we need to wait for the Earth to rotate. So we need a couple of hours to make an image. Now, this guy is barely moving in a couple of hours. This guy will be moving a lot in a couple of hours. So now let's see a simulation, how we imagine this motion looks like. This will be a human clock. Uh, so it will be showing you the pass of time, the passage of time. And you will see how much in the associated time is M87 changing and how much 
if capitalism starts changing, if our simulations are uh, have anything to do with the reality. So it looks like that. So now let me remind you that we need this six, say about six hours to make an image. So in six hours, this guy is not really changing a lot. It's actually barely visible that it's moving at all. It is moving, trust me, not slowly. But this guy is changing like crazy. So what? So the problem, one of the problems we have to uh, tackle with is how do we even define an image of a source, a single static image, if the underlying source is changing during the time we have to make our image. Right, so it's like taking a photo with a camera in 19th century. Don't move for a minute. If someone starts to run and go around, it will not be a good image. So we have to figure out how to define properly um, the average image. And the hope was that if we take the data from ALMA and for, from SMA, we take we get the light curves of the object. We normalize the VI data by the light curves, and maybe we will remove a little bit of this variability. So this is just one of the reasons to study connected uh, element um, uh, interpolation. <laughs> Another reason why we uh, why I, I talk about that is because I left that part of the work. So I kind of I want to talk a little bit about uh, my particular uh, input to, to this uh, whole uh, research. Okay, so some remarks about the data from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, interferometry is not something image domain directly. It's not like looking at the telescope uh, in an optical wavelength when you see the image. What you see, what you measure, is the Fourier components, are the Fourier components of the associated image. So this is a two dimensional Fourier plane. And this is where we have data, where we collect the data. Uh, each uh, color corresponds to a pair of telescopes. Each pair of telescopes is itself an interferometer. And then they are not points, but lines because Earth is rotating. So this is what we call an aperture synthesis. If the Earth was static, we would only have one point, I say this point, and that the whole, um, not the whole arc. Uh, so this is the amplitude of the complex data that we measure. And there is a fun thing to see here for the Fourier transport aficionados. Uh, what I plotted in the background is a model of a ring that is blurred, a blurred ring, just that. And Fourier transfer of a blurred ring. So this is a model with three degrees of freedom. It has total intensity, the uh, uh, radius of, uh, of your ring, and how much blur it is. Three degrees of freedom, and it's enough to capture some properties of data decently. It's not a proof that the reality looks like a ring because it's well, it's an ill-posed problem, really. But it's a necessary condition. If it didn't look like uh, like a ring at all. That would be already, we will know something, something is different than we thought it would be. And these are our light curves from ALMA array and SMA array. So just the compact source, but average, no structure, uh, no structure known, a single number. So we ended up using these light curves in many ways to calibrate the, uh, the data of the Event Horizon Telescope. I think it was quite a big success how we managed to improve the data quality through the analysis of light curves. And again, because I read that, I will spend a little more time on, on this. First of all, through this analysis of ALMA data, we were able to absolutely calibrate ALMA, meaning, uh, uh, meaning constrain the instrumental gains. So ALMA data are flawless, up to you know, some small systematics. Then because we have a light curve and <clears throat> ALMA is a short baseline, it doesn't resolve uh, the source, it only see a false point source, so we know exactly what it's supposed to measure. It's supposed to measure light curve. Then we absolutely calibrate second station, Apex, in Chile. Then we have another pair of, pair of stations that are close and do not resolve the source. So again, both guys should see light curve. So we remove one more degree of freedom from, from this pair. And then also there is a dish in Mexico uh, that is a very large, 50 meter dish, LMT. Uh, if the dish is big, it has a very small beam. So it's a problem to point it right in the right, the right direction. So it had very large uh, pointing problem, which manifested with the kind of crazy variation of the amplitude uh, gates. But then if we have this light case, we could give a better prior for that. So now it seems that we have kind of calibrated five out of eight, uh, uh, eight telescopes in the EHT array through the analysis of light. Case. So 
Maybe that's a great improvement. But also, there is this. Because from our analysis, we are not missing much. And actually, no, I don't have it in the slide. Okay, maybe I will just show that. So the part that the part is not missing. So these are the guys that are probing uh, arc second scale, and these are the guys that already probe uh, micro arc second. And because there is no, you know, mismatch between this value, uh, we say that yeah, it looks like we're getting it right. Everything that I'm is unresolving. Is Sagittarius this time? Yeah. Good question. Okay, so now we have um, with this fancy calibration, we have three days of uh, of uh, alma line pairs. Uh, they look like that. And in the papers published in May, we gave images for these two days. Now the question: Why we didn't try to publish or do the uh, present the analysis of April 11? Well, two reasons. One reason is Chandra detected a flare just before our EHT observation. So the uh, Sagittarius is that has this sort of bimodal um, behavior. Sometimes it's quiet, sometimes it emits violent X-ray infrared flares. And this was different time. So what, what does it mean for the radio morphology of the stars? Is it still a ring? We, we don't know. I mean, uh, we didn't publish uh, on that. Uh, but we kind of we wanted to play it safe. So we wanted to uh, write papers about the quiet state of Sagittarius this time. And also we measured in the light curve that there is much more variability on this day and on the other days. So one more reason not to uh, not to try to put out uh, these behaviors. I made a guess about how the source maybe looked like during the flare, but it's an unofficial guess. Maybe it was right. <laughs> X-ray flare is some sort of very energetic uh, explosion. Well, who knows? Maybe there is no ring, maybe there is this atomic mushroom. Huh? <laughs> uh, but it's unofficial interpretation so far. Uh, right. So, what do we learn? From, uh, what else do we learn from the light curves itself? It's interesting to notice that, well, this, these are only the light curves uh, observed since 2005 with histograms and kind of with a story. Uh, they don't change all that much, really. It's about three Jansky. Jansky is a measure uh, of uh, flux density, plus minus one, let's say. So it's not changing dramatically. In X ray, it can change by two orders of magnitude during the flame uh, state. Then it's also interesting to notice that apparently there are some really, really long term like This is when we made our HD observations. The source was at the very low state in terms of uh, amplitude or brightness. And I, I told you that the 20 seconds from characteristic time scale. So, correlations on the time scale of a year, I find it a little bit surprising, but it, it, it looks like that. Uh, now we can analyze the variability of the source uh, through uh, looking at the lightness. And the tool to do that, a popular tool, is called a structure function. Structure function is pretty much like power spectral analysis, but without going to Fourier domain. So just sorting energy of variation as a function of uh, time duration. So longer time to the right and higher amplitudes uh, up. So black line is three days combined. Blue lines is individual day, April 6, 7, 11. This is noise level. So a couple of uh, things we already see. It's really a red noise process, meaning there's more, more energy at longer time scales. There is a slope that we can measure. It corresponds to a PSD slope or spectral density slope of minus 2.6. Then we see that already at one minute scale, uh, we are about the estimated level of noise, meaning it's an intrinsic source variability already at time scales as short as a minute, very short time scale for change. Then we see that there is something, some kind of break in this uh, function, which could have a physical interpretation, but I will try not to speculate too much now. I will speculate in some paper, probably. Uh, there is another one that is likely just the effect of limited sampling. And interesting thing that I mentioned, that the flaring day is very different from the other days. You can see that this blue curve is below the average on these two days, quite some days, and it's far above um, the, the average on the uh, flaring day. So we need a lot of going on during this flaring day 
uh, with this compact uh, source. Actually, uh, there is a associated problem with that, but theorists uh, working on that are kind of digesting and it's a big problem for us. And the problem is that it seems that all our numerical simulations uh, produce too much variability. So these are simulations, and this is the region on the spe uh, structure function um, where the constraints from the data leak. So it's a mismatch. It indicates that we are really missing some important part of physics in our kind of most sophisticated numerical simulation. Some people will start referring to that as variability crisis. I don't know if it's a crisis already, but uh, it's not, not great that we are not marching on the, on the property. How many epochs the data constraints cover? Sorry? How many epochs the data constraints cover? How many, what was the observing time for the data? But this is from these three days of observation. So three days, and you, you're sure you, you're not biased by just basically not capturing. Yeah, that, that, that could be. Reality. Yeah, that could be. Although, you know, so actually, uh, well, this is based on three days, but I did a lot of statistical analysis with all these 15 years of life. Okay. And it, it is pretty consistent. It's not that uh, the flux is low, but really what we, uh, how we define this variability is kind of normalized. So it's relative variability. So it's how many percent uh, uh, in terms of percentage of change. So I, I I don't think that you know, but we will know better when we have uh, months months of data and not uh, day to day that we have. Uh, what else we learn? Uh, just in like this. Well, uh, spectral index. I already mentioned a small of the SCD function. It's near zero, so it means we are near the maximum of SCD. This is the synchrotron maximum um, for uh, for this sort of uh, source. Uh, but we can also resolve that. Uh, Minute after minute, because of huge power, uh, huge sensitivity of power. And then you see an interesting thing that on April 11, this is the flare uh, denoted with a star, uh, the spectral index is lower. Lower spectral index means um, more optically thin medium usually. So it kind of looks like something changed during this flare or after the flare, and there was some more optically thin material in the, um, in the system. We, well, I have an interpretation, but you know, it's uh, uh, tricky. Uh, but it's definitely something that uh, theorists can use to constrain their models for uh, flame. Now, a good thing is that we do not detect any uh, delays between frequency bands in ALMA. ALMA has a wide, reasonably wide band from 212 to 250 30 gigahertz, and we should be seeing delays um, if there were even a couple of seconds delays. What does it mean that we don't see them? It probably means that the system is really optically thin, mostly, because if the system was optically thin, photosphere at different frequency would be at different location, and it would lead to delays. No delays probably means that it's optically thin all the way to the horizon, which is good. If we want to make an image of horizon scale source, we better be able to see through the material. So the last part about, uh, about uh, the light curve science is my paper from like two months ago. I actually tried to start working with the April 11 data, but just with ALMA, not with the EHDDLPI data set. And I interpreted some features in the polarized light curve as a signature of an orbital motion. Now, is it a proper interpretation? I don't know, but I hope this paper will be well cited. Uh, the thing is that if you fit an orbital model to that, you can estimate a bunch of parameters of the system, including, well, the period, what kind of radius it implies, the radius of 10 uh, gravitational masses. It would mean that uh, it's a feature uh, on the pretty much the size, uh, scale of the orbit of Mercury, but zipping from this orbit in 70 minutes. So it implies speed of 30% uh, of the speed of light. And it's uh, the model, as it, well, the model predicts that there should be a dominance of vertical magnetic field and low inclination. So we have from non VLBI data, here we have some estimate of the properties of the system. And it would look, this hotspot would look something like that. And now I mentioned to you that there is a more optically, optically thin phase after the, uh, after the uh, X ray flare. Well, we imagine that this guy is actually low density feature, but a very strongly polarized feature, and that it, it is indeed very optically thin. And so, kind of theoretical interpretation agrees with those features in spectral index that we see. 
but it's still a little bit handway. This is kind of a, well, this is a fun, fun model, but it's a toy model. But did you marginalize the inclination? Because when we have <laughs> inclination, you have a erotic meaning effect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so all of that, uh, all of that is with full uh, treatment of lensing of uh, GR effect, actually also the native transfer, slow light, everything is taken into account. And by marginalized, it's not a fit to data. Okay. The, the data are blue, red is the model. It's not a fit to data. In terms of high score, it would be thousand probably. Um, but um, so, so the way it was marginalized, it was me making a grid of models and putting them on the top of data. And we can, this one looks kind of like data. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I will not be bragging about my approach to, the, to statistical analysis in this paper. <laughs> okay, so let's get back uh, to the uh, data from the large telescope, the Earth size telescope, not from the ARMA. Uh, I mentioned the variability as a big problem for us, but it's one more big problem. But it's unfortunately a little cloud of matter somewhere, kind of halfway, it's not uh, between us and the galactic center. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit small, but it's actually exactly in the line of sight, and it's messing up our photo trajectory. It's doing it scatters our photos, uh, so that's a, that's a little bit of a problem for us. Uh, and this scattering screen works in two ways. There is a diffractive action, which is smearing everything, uh, and it corresponds on Fourier plane to these uh, continuous lines. And there is a re refractive action, which re relates to the substructure of this cloud. Uh, and it produces a bunch of high spatial frequency features. So the power of those features, we estimate it to be like that. And I just dragged uh, an image of how we imagine the effect of this uh, scattering screen. So this, here you see a source blur. So this is a diffractive action. And this refractive action is adding this bunch of uh, small features that correspond to power at uh, high spatial frequencies. So the algorithm have to be able to deal with this scattering. They have to know about the model of the scattering screen to be able to descatter uh, the, uh, the model and tell, tell us what is the most likely appearance of the stuff behind the scattering screen without uh, making image of all this uh, weird mess. So that is another complication. And this is why imaging of this uh, source was kind of a pain. And this is also why we spent like five years doing that. Uh, trying to understand what's going on. So any algorithm before being able to touch the real data has to prove that it can deal with this effect of scattering, uh, with effect of time variability, and that it is able to reconstruct different image morphologies. So we had a bunch of test data that were sub, uh, uh, subsequently uh, corrupted with this uh, scattering and stuff uh, of different morphologies. Well, the obvious reason was we didn't want our algorithm to just produce a ring anytime we get whatever kind of data. Like if the data is a double, we really don't want the algorithm to make a pretty ring. That would be kind of bad for, um, for our trustworthiness. Uh, so this is, so before touching the data, all the algorithm had to prove that they can re uh, recover proper geometry of different geometric models. Then how do we, Evaluate algorithm. Well, this is this one is obvious. All the algorithm have to prove that they can reconstruct an image that is consistent with the data. Right? Okay, this is kind of obvious. But also we have criteria like the robust, robustness of the structure. So what I mean here is we have an algorithm. If you if this algorithm has a bunch of hyperparameters, if you tune one parameter by one percent, and all of a sudden the structure is gone and the image looks very different, this is not a transport algorithm. So we were carefully vetting our algorithm. And now, in a form of a little animation, I will show you how this final process of choosing the image, uh, with how we went through with that. So we have this bunch of algorithms, different methods, um, and we ask them to reconstruct the real data. And they produce a bunch of images. And you can see that those images are quite different in terms of Sagittarius, uh, for the Sagittarius A star. So what we do now is we have a kind of a machine learning tool that classifies them into different clusters based on topological properties of the, of the image. So now we have the algorithm wants to split these images into four different clusters. And these are, these are the averages in individual clusters. 
You can see that these three are kind of similar. They are all arranged, but the distribution of brightness can be slightly different in different clusters. So the algorithm classifies them as separate types of image. And there is also uh, an image that doesn't really show this ring-like structure so well. And these are the occurrences, the uh, frequencies of how often they show up in this set of reconstructions. So not too often. These guys like three percent of the entire population of uh, reconstructions of, of images. So then what we do is we average these guys with weighted averages corresponding to their frequencies of occurrence. Now, and then we get this guy that we show to people in our press release. So uh, why that sort of procedure? Well, I don't know. We just we, need, we needed somehow to marginalize over these different uh, solutions, and this seemed like a reasonable procedure that also allows us to ask the question: How often do we get topology consistent with a ring? So we did the same thing for M87, but here for M87 we didn't use this approach in 2019. We just directly merged that. We didn't care about those clusters or morphological. Uh, correspondence, uh, and if we ask our algorithm to, hey, could you really divide M87 images into four different clusters, even if you don't want to do that, uh, then it did, and those look like that, they are really similar, and occurrences are pretty much the same. So it wasn't a necessary procedure for, uh, for M87, but it, it seems that it's uh, some kind of procedure to define the average image uh, for, uh, for Sagittarius X star. So I'm done with, the, with this part uh, about uh, imaging highlights, and I see that actually I'm uh, short of time. I will accelerate now. Uh, so just one conclusion here, that we really have a vast majority of reconstructions showing a ring-like morphology. Okay, so now I will zip through, actually probably most interesting thing for you. So sorry if I will make it short. Um, the theoretical interpretation is covered later, so we have 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's very nice. <laughs> okay, so in a Bayesian, in a Bayesian spirit, uh, I will now talk about what can we infer about the well, MHD, the here code for astrophysics, my magnetohydrodynamics, let's say this is astrophysics, assuming that the space time is kept. So we will assume that space time, we will see what can we infer about the properties of this system. So to do that, we established a huge library of numerical models. And this is a multi-dimensional library of literally millions of, of synthetic images of, of black holes. And I will just mention the main di dimensions of this library. Uh, magnetized uh, solutions where magnetic field is dominant and it uh, rules the behavior of the gas. They're called, called MED for magnetically arrested disk. Uh, and weakly magnetized uh, accretion solutions, uh, which are called same for standard and normal uh, evolution. It's a little bit of a stop tortured um, <laughs> thing, but, uh, but you, you see how people want to call mad and same. Um, okay, then you have a spin of a black hole that changes from large negative to large positive. Then you have a single number to parameterize all the complicated plasma physics and how the electrons are heated is the electrons radiation that we see. It's a synchrotron radiation from electrons that we are observing. And the question is how hot are those electrons? Are they colder than the gas or are they, well, hotter is implausible because they cool down through, through radiation. But this number is telling you uh, how, much, how much colder they are, uh, the electrons in the disk, with respect to the uh, ions in the disk. Uh, then the inclination, we probe all sorts of possible inclinations. We don't know a priori what is the inclination of Sagittarius uh, A star. Uh, well, and then there is a bunch of uh, systems, a bunch of simulations for which we didn't really make that systematic uh, search through uh, parameter space because they're very costly simulations. We don't have. Uh, full grids for all the parameters. And then we have a bunch of constraints that we can use to compare these numerical models to the data. There are constraints coming from the Event Horizon Telescope. There are some from other uh, observations, including infrared uh, flux and X-ray flux. And then there is this variability that I mentioned to you that, is, that it is a problem for us. Okay, so another animation to show how we go through this process. Let's say that these are all our models. Uh, they are, of course, the, uh, dynamic. Uh, and now we will start scoring this data set with our constraints. So if we consider, the, for instance, the size 
uh, from the event horizon telescope observation, we reject some of the models. Then we add morphology from the EHT data, a lot of models reject. Now we have uh, uh, the spectrum, so infrared constraints, um, X-ray constraints, still more models rejected. Then size at lower radio frequencies, and we are left with pretty much two uh, solutions out of this large library of models. And let me introduce you to something we call pizza plots. Pizza plots are showing you which models are good, which are bad. Red is bad, uh, green is good, yellow is inconclusive. Uh, net solution, so magnetized, uh, same, so not magnetized, spin, different spins in different columns, uh, this uh, temperature of electrons, factor uh, here, and inclination azimuthal. So you see that EHT is rejecting a lot of models from our large library. Uh, non EHT is also helpful. These constraints from infrared, from X ray, from low radio frequencies are also useful. And if we put it all together, these are the two guys that were left in the, in the previous slide. Um, but here is a problem with the light curve variability that I mentioned. These two guys are strongly rejected. <laughs> so there is not a single model that can survive uh, the constraints, including variability. But I personally am not too worried about that because a couple of years ago, Nobody, uh, I would not trust anybody to tell me that the simulations can reproduce the average problem. Now, if you ask for mean and also for standard deviation, that is one more step. St let's take it step by step. There is something missing with variability, but maybe it's not influenced the average uh, image uh, too much. So this is the summary of the uh, astrophysics. And let me mention what models are preferred. These two models that, uh, that were uh, good in the end, they are both Magnetized, so met solution, uh, low inclination, similar as my little hot spot in the one of uh, in, in my paper, low temperature coupling. Actually, they want these uh, electrons to be as cold as we are open to, uh, so maximally decoupled from the temperature of uh, of the protons, and uh, positive uh, positive spin. So uh, the hot spot study that I did also implies met and also implies low inclination. So I'm a little bit consistent with the VLBI uh, analysis. This is very good. And where is final, the last part of the talk. Now we will invert our Bayesian logic. And now we will try to say something about the space and geometry, assuming that our models are representative of the reality. So are things consistent with, uh, with a care a solution for the space? First of all, we can do a simple measurement we can take our simulations, we can ask how much we have to change the size of the image in our simulation to match the observed size, and that will inform us about the mass of the object, right? because the size uh, in the simulation is related to the prescribed mass. So we can make a measurement of mass by scaling our uh, numerical simulations to match the real observations. And then we get a measurement of 4 plus minus 1 million solar mass. Not very accurate. Because those guys who study orbits of stars in infrared have error bars, orders of magnitude narrower. These are their estimates. Uh, these guys uh, say 4 million, these guys say 4.3 million. Actually, Gravity Group, the European group, and UCLA, UCLA American group are not very consistent with themselves. But our posterior looks like that. So this guy is this uh, red band, this guy is this green band. And our procedures are like that. So we are consistent with everybody. We are not making a great measurement here, but we, we could be inconsistent. Hey, it's good. So now let's try to constrain non careness of space time. We measure some diameter of a ring. We know M over D from these guys, from the infrared observations. They are better than us in establishing this. So let's use their information, their procedures. When there is a Schwarzschild analytic scaling for the expected size of this feature, that you can calculate on the napkin, really. It's a, it's a simple calculation in Schwarzschild space time to, to make. Then we have a theory. So, this is all the different models of astrophysics that we employ in our library of simulations. And of course, they give a little bit of a stretch uh, here. It's not a single value. They make a correction to this measurement. Then our algorithms are intended. Algorithms make it biases or at least they are not perfect in recovering the proper diameter of a feature. 
So there is another posterior to convolve everything with. But then we believe or we assume that we can learn about these two guys uh, by analysis of this uh, simulated data, that we can run simulated data from our pipelines and figure out how, how this uncertainty works. And if anything is left, if it's not unity, there is some delta, it means we are inconsistent with uh, with uh, current space time, or or maybe our model work. I don't know uh, what we would claim if we found non-zero delta. Uh, okay, and I think that's pretty much my last slide because it's a solution to this uh, equation on the previous um, uh, slide. This is uh, what care space time admits for this delta factor. It can be zero for short shield. A little less than zero for maximally spinning care. So, this is the range uh, consistent with care space time. And these are our posterior. There are many lines because we are uncertain about everything. So, we made this analysis under different assumptions with different tools. But they, they are pretty much the same. And these are the priors from Keck, American group, and from VLTI, the, uh, the European group. So, we are all consistent with care. What's more, you can it's not model free, but you can also cast gravitational wave uh, uh, analysis results into this space of delta. Uh, so what they imply for the shadow of the black hole. You don't see the shadow of the black hole with LIGO, but we can calculate what it would uh, the vague constraints would imply. And if you do that, you can construct well objects of LIGO, Sagittarius A star and 87, 10 orders of magnitude of testing careness of space time and always consistent. I think it's a very pretty plot telling you, well, what we hope would be true, that the gravity doesn't care about this mass. The care solution is the care solution, whatever you mass you put there. 10 orders of magnitude, it seems that the space time is still described by the very same equation. This is kind of amazing. Okay, and I'm done. I will leave you staring into the abyss of two uh, black holes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. And now we have time for questions. Do you use first? No microphone. No microphone. You can have to speak loudly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the uh, first question is about uh, modeling. So uh, you just uh, do ray tracing, or do you also add some wave light effects of the pipe? What is it? For, for simulations uh, to yeah. construct the images, do you just do the, the usual ray tracing or do you also add wave like effects? Oh, of course, we take the uh, kind of wavelength of it. So, the way it uh, works, we have this GRMX simulation. It gives us a 3D cube or 4D cube because time effects are also important uh, of, of data. And then we have uh, this kind of delta and we ray trace back. So, we assume we have to assume the frequency. Uh, that the observer is doing, but this is the frequency at our at which our instrument observes. So we ask for millimeter wavelength at the observer, we ray trace back, and we solve the DT transfer equation all the way. So it means that they are emitted perhaps as different frequencies, but because of redshift, Doppler, and whatever, we observe them at millimeter wavelength, but fully accounted for uh, effects of, of wavelength. Okay, and the second question is uh, this. Uh, because you are measuring MHD as soon as GR. So, uh, can you tell something about this uh, effective in medium? Like, can you say something about uh, the electric magnetic tensor? Uh, <laughs> well, okay. So, uh, okay, let me say that. Uh, so, all those simulations that we consider are GR MHD simulations, meaning general relativistic magnetohydral dynamic. Now, it is an assumption that they work, that they are fine uh, for this sort of environment. The reason why they may not be perfect and why they are for sure not perfect, by, but they may be effective, uh, is that this is not, uh, not the truth. MHD is flu uh, are fluid. Uh, this is collisionless plasma. It should not behave exactly like fluid. So here is one reason to take uh, all uh, everything you get from GRMHD simulations with a grain of salt. But, uh, you know, uh, we could one day do kinetic simulations and kinetic theory, but I, the, it, it's a pain. It's like computationally, it's, it's ridiculous. So that's 
Yeah, I'm happy to talk, talk, talk some more about this limitation, but it, it, it will get technical quickly. <laughs> Questions? Uh, some time ago, I studied this hydrodynamic magnetic hydrodynamics. My question is, what is map? It means that oh, it's, it's frozen in the magnetic yeah. field. Uh, pretty much, yes. So the magnetic field lines, magnetic field is so strong that it blocks the accretion. It's like a prism of vertical magnetic field around the, around the black hole, and it stops the accretion. But then the accretion will pile up. The matter will pile up and at some point it will break to magnetic field lines. And then there is a flux eruption, and then there is that's the interpretation by some people how these flaring events work. Mm -hmm. So this is matter breaking through the, uh, through through the magnetic, magnetic field surface. lines. Yeah, and then you have uh, a lot of things going on, it's getting bright uh, briefly. Yeah, but that's just uh, so many new uh, terminologies. <laughs> <laughs> it was usually yeah. it's called uh, frozen. But yeah, I just thought this uh, mass versus the same is fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it is frozen. Uh, yes, it is exactly that. It is arrested by magnetic field. Mm -hmm. The matter cannot penetrate the strong magnetic field. Thank you very much for, for a very nice talk. It's definitely a huge piece of impressive work. Uh, although I must say I'm a frequentist by heart, but you know what they say about frequentists, they are just naive by Asian, it's, it's that they know, uh, they didn't learn that uh, even frequentists by Asian special case. I'm when I say fully Bayesian, I'm usually a cat. Yes, so I feel. Of course. <laughs> uh, but of course, this measurement wouldn't be possible with it, without this higher degree statistical data analysis and basically fully Bayesian. But I have a question about the particular case when you apply machine learning. Uh, why the number four of the, the class of minimum? So, so this, was, uh, this was chosen by the algorithm. Okay, so it says that this is the max minimum meaningful number that I can. Uh, that, that, that's how I understand that. This is, and I said, like, you know, I said machine learning is a fancy one, it's a clustering algorithm, which is kind of. Uh, yeah, one can also just call it statistical analysis. I mean. Because, with some respect, I think, I mean, some of the reconstructions are less frequent. And you need to combine them, but maybe all of them are so strong some aspect of reality, right? So I mean you choose the one factor you right. show to the public, but right. All of them mm -hmm. have some degree of, of yeah. So this is why why we chose to do this clustering and to show all the clusters, right? Because in principle we could say, okay, this is the average image that we get, and we wanted to well give this kind of safety net. Right. Well, sometimes we're not getting really this uh, ring like uh, morphology, but it's like three percent. So is it really the, you know, this is a dynamically changing system. Maybe at some moment like there is more, there is more matter in falling, so the optical depth changes. So maybe you don't actually see the this darkness in the center because it's obscured by emitting facets. I don't know. Now we have time for the second question or not? Maybe the last question of uh, well, I'm gonna do Yes. I agree with point that it was very impressive talk and very impressive piece of work. But I have some, well, second thoughts about the more and more involved methods of interpreting your measurements in particular, right? Uh, like comparing with models. It's really encouraging that you have invalidated most of the models because uh, I have a very little encounter with astrophysics, but I witnessed uh, conferences, but especially young people argued very hotly about parameters which were irrelevant in a sense, right? Uh, you mentioned that you uh, filtered your algorithms with the respect of the fact that if you uh, twiddle a little bit, that it becomes, it, the results are stable, right? I witnessed discussions whether some phenomenological parameter cannot be six, it must be 5,5, uh, because the author of the model, uh, his perspective on tenure depends <laughs> very much on the way. No, I am serious. This no, no. is the absolute mechanism which, in my opinion, exists, depended on his ability or her ability to impose the view on the general community. I would say that most of the, I mean, the, the models have to be weighted by the some sort of common sense and knowledge of authors. 
in other part of physics, uh, the community knew who basically knew what was doing and who was just fishing for more of the publications, basically. Uh, but from time to time, there are funny things happening. Yeah, no, sure, of course, everywhere. And this critical approach to the input yeah. is similar to the one which you demonstrated you did by uh, approaching various numerical models, so to speak, numerical simulations. Uh, the same critical approach Approach to models, I think, uh, would be uh, needed because this is a very involved way of interpreting measurements, right? It's not like people measured something and there is just one number they measure, yeah, an amount of the model of the electrons, yeah. and some guys computed it to the eighth order in QED and compared result, right? That is very clear. Here it's extremely involved. I fully agree. It's fully clear. And so I would think about necessity to consider from the methodology point of view. I fully agree. How we can start, we can try to keep the rigor at the adequate level, rigor of interpretation. Let me just try to address uh, some of these uh, comments. I finish the minute. Yeah. So first of all, fortunately, I'm not even on uh, tenure track. So don't worry. <laughs> no, I, no, I, no, I was not talking about you, but no, no, I, that's the uh, But, uh, but I, I, I totally agree about this uh, sort of uh, well, over interpreting models that is a little bit of a problem in the community. If you make a focused model, you will uh, get statistical posterior that will be narrow. But if reality is not exactly a realization of your model, then there will be epistemic errors, errors related to the choice of model. And it seems to be quite a common uh, approach in the natural sciences to overinterpret or overstress results from the model. I don't think we are uh, pushing you know, some kind of numbers we estimate too much. All we are saying is if reality is well represented by this collection of models, which again, grain of salt, uh, Collisionless plasma, and misunderstood or not understood dissipation, and so on. There are issues. But if that's the case, uh, we hint at low inclination, we hint at positive spin, and so on. So, but the comment is, of course, fully uh, understood, and I fully agree with uh, what you're saying. And we, I'm looking forward to reject all the models because then we will start learning yeah. how to improve yeah. the models. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah.